Okay. I'm just going to do a quick holler to bring people up and then I'll lower the tone. Good afternoon, Telegraph Outdoor Show people. How the devil are you? I hope you're good and I hope you bought lots of bikes and tents. But what I definitely think you should do is come over to the Incredible Ocean Zone because I'm about to give a talk about my favorite whale. This is full of incredible facts. If you're ever on a date and it's not going that way, you can whip out one of those facts and the date is just going to be rejuvenated. It's just going to be incredible. You'll definitely get a second date. So what I do is definitely come and park your butts on one of these benches. So I'll get talking. My name's Russell and I am uh, an oceanographer. I get involved with this educational project called Incredible Oceans which is aiming to get oceans into schools around the country. I work for this organization called Whale Fest, and we organize an event called Whale Fest, which happens to be the largest marine festival on Earth. We had 15,000 people a day attend it last year. Next year's one's hopefully going to be in Cardiff. This high, heavily pixelated man here is um, Steve Backshaw from Deadly 60. He came and gave a little talk, which is very nice. There's a lot of good fun, so come along. Um, when I'm not doing that, I study plankton at Bath University. I think it's really, really important stuff that not many people know anything about. These are tiny, tiny single-celled plants. To give you an idea of how big they are, um, they are, this is a human hair, if you plucked one out and held it up to the screen, this is how big they are there. So they are absolutely tiny plants. I'll show you really quickly how important they are. Can everyone take a great big breath in and breathe out? That breath came from the trees. Now let's have a second breath. <gasps> Breathe that one out. <sighs> that one came from the seas. It is true. The oceans make half of our oxygen. These little guys living in the ocean are incredible. They come in lots of different shapes and sizes. The biggest one, one of the main ones that I'm going to be studying, is this guy, the death star of plankton, called Volvox. It's pretty hardcore. But anyway, you didn't come here to hear about plankton. You came here to hear about these guys. Here we go. So anyone know what type of whale this is? Yeah? It is a sperm whale. Exactly right. And this is my favorite whale. It is an incredible animal. And the more I learn about them, the more amazing they become. Hopefully, maybe you've already got a favorite whale in mind. You're like, well, I quite like the blue whale. I like quite like Cuvier's beaked whale. This whale kicks all other whales' butts, and I'm going to tell you why. Because it is amazing. So, let's find out. So, a lot of people are like, well, Russell, why is it your favorite whale? And I'm like, well, it's called the sperm whale. And they're like, so, ah, uh -huh, is that why it's your favorite whale? Because it has a rude name. And whenever I go into pro uh, secondary schools, loads of the teenage boys start sniggering, hee hee hee, sperm whale, like that. And I'm like, well, actually, that's not why it's my favorite whale. And I will tell you why it has got a slightly rude name a bit later on. Um, I quite like them because they look ridiculous. They look a little bit like a nuclear submarine with a flap underneath them. They've got this giant stupid head and this weird little eye at the side. But that's not why they are my favorite whale. One of my main reasons that they're my... Oh, look, they're so cute. They're so cute. This is a baby, a baby sperm whale. And it's the, the, taking milk from its mummy. So they can be cute too. A lot of people think that whales are fish. They're not, they're mammals. Um, they lay they lay babies. They don't lay babies. They give birth to babies. They don't lay eggs. And they suckle their young. This is taking milk from its mummy. It's so cute. But let's find out why they're really hardcore. So, they are the largest carnivore on Earth. The biggest meat eaters. This diver here is approximately the same size as me, 1.8 meters. And this is a female. She's approximately 19 meters long. But she is nothing compared to the bull male, which is a whopping 25 meters long. You would not want to mess with an angry bull sperm whale. So why else are they amazing? Well, let's find out. Oh, so... They are the loudest animal on Earth. Is anyone here particularly loud? Okay. So what I'd like you to do, sir, 
I'd like you to go nuts at the microphone and make as much noise as you possibly can. And we're going to see how loud you actually are. Can you please stand up? Okay, you ready for this? What's your name? Cameron. Cameron? Okay, are you ready to destroy some ears? Okay. Three, two, one. <laughs> that was good. Round of applause to Cameron. Well, hey. Well, I certainly felt a slight ringing in my ears, which means Cameron probably got to about 120 decibels. And if Cameron should so wish to come up to me and go ee into my ears for a prolonged period, I would end up with hearing damage. So 120 decibels is about the same as Roadworks. If I were to go and see Metallica in concert, and I broke onto stage and I'd go right up next to the guitar amp and was like jitter, 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 then I'd be exposed to 140 decibels of sound. I'd get, I'd feel pain, I would probably burst an eardrum and I'd lose a lot of hearing frequencies. I'd get tinnitus in my ears ringing. If I were to wear like a lovely fireproof suit and go to NASA and stand next to one of the rockets taking off, then that would be 160 decibels. It would blow my ears out instantly. I would uh, be deaf for the rest of my life and I'd feel extreme pain. In air, the loudest sound that you can get is 190 decibels. After that, it just becomes a pressure wave which would knock you over. But because water, the particles in it are closer together and denser than they are in air, it means that sound can travel faster through it, it can travel much further through it, but it also means you can get louder sounds. Sperm whale clicks of up to 240 decibels have been recorded. So this means that people swimming next to sperm whales have been knocked unconscious by how loud their sound is. And if for some reason a sperm whale wanted to come up to you and go like that, then they could vibrate your body to pieces. But that also means they are so insanely loud that two sperm whales can talk to each other anywhere on Earth. So they see us with mobile phones and like, you guys, you guys are suckers. Why don't you just shout? It's like me being able to shout to my auntie in Australia and just go like, hey, auntie, how are you? She'd be like, I'm fine. But the, I guess the bad thing is, is that everyone else can hear your conversation. So yes, they're insanely loud, which is a cool thing. So why else are they amazing? Well, we talked about how they are the biggest carnivore on earth. I have here one of their teeth. This has been scrimshawed. So uh, this is, yeah, basically old whaling sailors have taken the teeth out and they've carved them while they've been at sea. So I'm going to pass this around if people want to feel kind of how heavy it is and imagine what it would be like to have a mouthful of these. So this whale, this one is unfortunately dead and it, it washed up on the beach. Um, you can see here it's teeth, it's only got teeth on the bottom jaw. The top has got holes in it so the teeth can slide up into it and keep its mouth closed, which is pretty amazing. Now, the thing is, is that when whales die, we don't just go, oh yeah mate, look, dead whale, isn't it? Right? We actually want to find out what the cause of death is. The same way as if we found a dead human, we'd be like, well, what? Why, why is this human dead? Same thing with whales. So we send scientists out that perform autopsies on them to figure out where maybe they ate too much plastic and it's bunged up their digestive tract. Maybe they didn't eat enough food. Maybe they were exposed to some navel testing, which um, kind of caused them to beach. Maybe they were ill, maybe they had a disease, maybe they were old. So, scientists go out, they open them up, and the cool thing in England is that all whales and dolphins that wash up on the beach legally belong to the Queen. So if she wanted to be like, I say, please bring the stinking, rotting whale carcass to my palace, we'd have to do that. Luckily, she's got a little deal with the Natural History Museum who send people out to dissect them. Now, the problem is when you dissect whales is they absolutely stink. They've got loads and loads of intestines, and inside their intestines are bacteria. And when they die, the bacteria inside their intestines start to digest their internal organs. And they give off loads and loads and loads of gas. So if you walk up to a whale and just stick a knife in it, then they can explode. So my next little clip is an exploding whale. If you don't like to see blood and guts, I suggest you close your eyes 
And I'm just going to reiterate for the smaller people in the audience that the whale was already dead and the scientists did it accidentally. This is not how you dissect a whale. That's pretty incredible. That's a good face. You're like, whoa! There you go. So don't walk up to whales and stick knives in them because they can explode a little bit like this as well, which is pretty bad. So the crazy thing about exploding whales is they do explode by themselves as well. And there was one that washed up on a beach in Thailand and it was stinking the place out. The, the, all the tourists stopped going there like, look, seriously, mate, just stick it on a lorry, take it to the dump, right? And as they were driving it through town, it exploded during rush hour, which is possibly the best excuse ever for being late for school. It's like, why are you late? Well, I was just going in and the whale exploded and there was guns all over the road and it stopped the traffic. So there we go. So that's a one to log and maybe use on a later date. So, you know, after you've gone through all your relatives and said that they're dead, and then you can say, use the whale one. Anyway, right, so why else are they amazing? So, if you guys do this with your hands, this is approximately how big your brain is. And the sperm whale holds the world record for having the biggest brain on Earth. Its brain is a foot across, and it has a similar cell density to our brains. It has a similar spindle density, and it has a massive surface area, which leads scientists to postulate that they are actually more intelligent than us, but in a way that our puny human brains can't possibly understand. They have a really rich culture, they have different languages, they have history and songs, so there's no reason why they wouldn't be insanely intelligent. So, loads of people will be like, so it's got a big brain, that's why it's got that stupid great big head. So if we look at what's inside its head, up here, this is its skull, and inside its skull is where its brain would be. And instead, its nose is filled with this really weird waxy oil substance called spermaceti. And this is where the sperm whale got its name, because when one washed up on a beach, a scientist, scientist, ran up to it, stuck a knife in its face, and all this white waxy goo started pouring out, and the scientist went, oh, that looks like sperm. All right, let's call it a sperm whale, because it's got loads of sperm in its head. Right, we actually now know that it's not sperm, and it is this waxy substance. So, has anyone here ever been out for a meal with their parents, and you're really, really bored, because they're talking about mortgages or something like that? But fortunately, you're saved, because there's a candle in the middle of the table that you can poke your finger in and play with the wax. Who's done that before? There we go, good stuff, right. So you know when the wax is a little bit slimy, that is what the sperm whale has inside its nose. And this is one of the reasons we used to hunt them, because for 200 years, every single candle and every single lantern on Earth was lit using oil and wax taken from inside sperm whale noses. In fact, up until the late 70s, NASA still used whale oil on their deep sea probes because it, it works at such a great temperature range. So a great science question that people can ask is why, okay? If you've, ever, if you've got a really annoying little brother or sister and they learn the word why, and you're like, can you get out of my room? And they're like, why? You're like, because I'm gonna tell mom and dad. They're like, why? And you're like, oh, I hate you, but it's actually an amazing science word. So I've just told you that there's loads and loads of weird waxy stuff inside the sperm whale's nose, so we could ask a science question, which is, why? Why? Well, thank you for asking. Two reasons. First of all, the sperm whale uses this to focus its incredible sound and fire it into things and also to detect it back. But this muscle on the top, is full of really hot blood. When the sperm whale wants to dive underwater, it doesn't swim down, because it can dive down to about 2,000 meters. And if it were to swim down all that way, it'd be tired by the time it got there. So what it does is it sucks all of the blood out of its nose. The wax is then exposed to the coldness of the ocean. It solidifies, it becomes denser, and then the whale gets dragged underwater by its nose and it sinks down to a thousand meters. At this point, there is no longer any light. It goes down to 2,000 meters. And again, we can ask our science question, which is why? Why is it diving so deep? It's trying to find its favorite food. 
These are giant squid. These weigh as much as a car. They can be up to 25 meters long and they are hideous animals. They are incredible killing machines. They are covered, their tentacles, with suckers this big that suck onto you like this. I apologize for showing you my hairy belly. Right, there you go. And you can try and remove the giant squid sucker now, madam. Oh, there we go, good work. But the difference between these suckers and giant squid suckers is that giant squid suckers are coated in teeth. So when they suck onto you, they take a great big chunk of skin and flesh out from you. And we can see this on sperm whale skin. So this is a section of sperm whale skin from 1910, and you can see that it's heavily scarred with these sucker rings all over it. But it gets even worse because these tentacles down the bottom are its kind of grabbing tentacles. And these have got swiveling hooks inside them. So they stab onto you and then they swivel them inside you so you can't back away. And then they drag you towards their mouth, which is a giant parrot's beak that takes chunks out of you until you die. So this is quite a difficult thing to catch and eat, but it also has a second really tricky thing. So what happens if you annoy a squid? What does it do? Go on, what does it do? It squirts ink, and what color is that ink? Black, exactly. Is black ink gonna be any good in a place where there's no light? No, there isn't. So they have got an incredible thing where they have got glow in the dark ink. So what I need right now is someone who is incredible at doing a squid impression. You look like you're made to do a squid impression. Okay, do you wanna come up here? Okay, round of applause. Right, what's your name? Sam. Right, Sam, have you ever done a squid impression? Okay, well this is, you're gonna have to think on your feet, okay? So I'm gonna give you some tentacles, there you go. And I'd like you to do your best squid impression to everyone and make a really good squiddy noise. That was incredible. Round of applause for that. Okay, Sam. So I'm going, to do, I'm going to remove your tentacles from me for a sec, and you're going to quickly become a safety squid, okay? So here you go. Here you can be a safety squid, and you're going to have a go at making some glow in the dark ink, okay? So if I'm the sperm whale and I'm trying to hunt you, if I come too close and you see me, then you can spray me with this stuff, and then I'm going to glow for the rest of the day. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to pull this one into that one, hold it up so everyone can see, and you're going to have a go at making some glow in the dark ink. Amazing! Can I get a round of applause for Sam for being the best giant squid that we've had here? Well done. Good work. I'm impressed. There, you can put that on your CV now. In my spare time, I enjoy impersonating giant squids. Brilliant. Thank you. Good work. So, giant squids, you've got to try and catch them without getting the horrible glow-in-the-dark goo all over you. Get that all over you. All the other giant squids are going to be able to see you coming because they've got the biggest eye on Earth and you'll be glowing and be like, well, that's great. I can't catch any food for the rest of the day. So luckily, sperm whales can not only communicate in sound, but they can see in sound. They use echolocation. And echolocation is they send a pulse of sound out and then it bounces off something and comes back. And if it takes a long time to come back, they know it's far away. If it takes a short time to come back, they know it's close. But sperm whale sonar is so complex that they can actually detect a grain of rice at 300 meters. When their sound hits something, they can not only see how far away it is, but they can see inside it. They can know what it's, ma what it's made of. They know what shape it is. They know what direction it's moving and how fast it's swimming. But, and then, because they can communicate in sound as well, it means once they've seen something in sound, then they can send what they've seen to any other whale on Earth. So that's like being able to send a 3D holographic text message using only your face, which is a pretty incredible thing. So they've gone on the water, they've sent their sound out, and they've found their giant squid. And they're like, there's one over there, there's a really big juicy one over there. So they've got to be careful, they sneak up to it really, really carefully. And when, just before they strike, they go, Dah! like that, and they make their giant whale noise. And this freaks the squid out, the squid's stunned, he's like, what's going on? 
and then you can eat them without getting those hooks and everything in them, which is incredible. And then what happens? They're down there. And sperm whales spend up to an hour underwater. That's how long they can hold their breath, and they eat as many squid as they can while they're down there. And uh, over time, they get a big belly full of squid. They're like, oh yeah, I ate loads of squid. And they can digest all of the squid except for the beak. And the beaks build up inside them and until they're like, oh dear, I got a really bad stomach ache, oh, it really hurts, I'm full of whale beaks, uh, squid beaks, oh, what do I do? So what does your mum say to you when you've got a poorly tummy? Let's have some people who haven't had their hands up. What does your mum say to you if you were like, mum, I've got a poorly tummy, what would she say to you? Shop and go to bed. What would she say? Sit down and drink some water. Okay, so let's say you tried that, and obviously sperm whales have got lots of water to drink. They're not very good at sitting down. They've done that, they're like, oh, it still really hurts. I still got loads of squid beaks. Oh, what can I do? So what would your mum say to you if you had a poorly tummy? Yeah, go on. Go to bed. Okay, that's not a bad idea. Go on. Go to the toilet! That's exactly right! Whenever I was little and I was like, I've got a poorly tummy, my mum was like, May, why don't you try and do a poo? And I was like, I don't need a poo! And she'd be like, why don't you try? And I was like, fine, but I don't need one. And you'd be like, oh yeah, I did need one, thanks mum! And luckily, that is a piece of advice that is, goes across all species. And that is what sperm whale mums tell their babies too. It's like, mom, I gotta tell me I gotta be too many squid. They're like, why don't you try and do a poo? So they squeeze out a giant ball of squid beaks, which let's face it, this is not gonna be fun to pass, and it goes boof out into the water as a giant cloud of whale poo, and then chunks of it float up onto the surface and wash up on beaches around the world. What would you do if you found some on the beach? Would you touch it? Would you poke it with a stick? Would you, pick, would you kick it at your sister? There you go. Well, this is what it looks like when it washes up on beaches, and it has a posh name. And because we're going to use a posh science word, we're going to extend our pinky fingers out, and I'd like you to say in your poshest science voice, Ambergris. Ambergris. There we go. Now, the cool thing about this, Ambergris, is that it's used to make perfume. So the next time someone puts perfume on, you can be like, ha ha, you're spraying well poo on yourself. Ha ha ha, which is quite cool. But the second thing, because it's used to make perfume, it's really expensive. A couple of years ago, a little girl called Lily was walking on the beach near Liverpool, and she found a blob, what she thought was earwax on the beach, it turned out to be a blob of ambergris, and she'd sold it for 12,000 pounds. There we go. So there, that's a new kind of, you say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a well poo finder. There you go, you'll be rich beyond your wildest dreams. So we've seen how nasty giant squid are. What I don't want is people to be too scared to go in the sea in case they get attacked by a giant squid. And we are lucky that giant squid live so deep underwater that we have hardly ever seen one alive. For years, we only knew they existed, but when they accidentally got tangled up in fishing nets, or when they washed up on beaches, or when we opened up whale stomachs and we saw them inside. But these are some of the only clips that we have of giant squid. This one where it accidentally attacked a deep sea um, submersible, and this one where they managed to capture it, just chilling out, having a float like that, which is pretty cool. So the crazy thing about giant squid, and how, that, the fact that we've never seen them, is if we look at a cross-section through the oceans, we're like, okay, yeah, we've got submarines, we can go all over the place in this ocean, but if you are in the Navy, that is how deep you can go. That is the crush depth of your, of your submarine. Any deeper, and your submarine will implode. The pressure of water will cause your submarine to crush, and you'd sink and die. Sperm whales can go that deep, two and a half thousand meters which is pretty incredible. And that's not even the average ocean depth, which is three and a half thousand meters. But this point down here, this is the Marianas Trench, and it's the deepest point on Earth. And it is so deep, so dark, and so dangerous, 
that only three people have ever been there. So these guys made a submarine back in the 1960s. Um, it's called the Trieste, and it was a, built by a French guy called Jacques Picard and an American guy called Don Walsh. And they were squished up into this little sphere here, and the top of it was all full of air tanks to help them get down and to get back up again. Now at that depth, with 11,000 meters of water pressing down on you, it's the equivalent of a ton on every square centimeter. So if you imagine if you drew a little square that was a centimeter by a centimeter, you'd have a ton pressing down on every surface at that depth. So if their submarine had got a hole in it, even the size of a pinprick, the water would have sprayed in with as much force that it would have been able to cut them in half like a laser beam. And if the water had gone in all at the same time, they would have been turned into a human smoothie in less than a second. Just poof, and a great big cloud of blood and guts. They wouldn't have even felt a thing. So these guys did it in the 1960s, and then no one did it again until 2012, when the director, James Cameron, used all the money from his films to build his own submarine. So he directed such incredible films, you guys probably know of Aliens, and uh, Terminator 2, all of these incredible films. Also did Avatar and Titanic. So he's an incredible deep sea ambassador. But yeah, this is the crazy thing, is you talk to people like, what do you want to do when you grow up? They're like, I want to be an astronaut. And in fact, being an astronaut is like so last season. We've sent 550 people to space. We've sent 24 people to the moon. 12 people have walked on the moon, but only three people have been to the deepest point on our planet, which is an absolutely crazy idea because we are a blue planet. We call it planet Earth, we should really call it planet water because 70% of it is covered by water. If we look at the surface, there it is, 100% surface, 30% land, 70% covered in water. Now the thing is, is that we don't really know anything about the sea. When I first stu started studying the oceans as an oceanographer, we had explored 2% of our world's oceans, which means that there is a whole lot of our ocean that we don't know anything about. We've now explored 5% of it, but that's still 65% of our own planet that we have no idea what is there. It is such a giant, a habitat that every single time we go underwater we find a brand new species that we have never seen before. On average we find a new species there every two weeks which is incredible and that's why I became an oceanographer. I think too often we're like oh let's go to space, let's go to Mars, let's do this and on our own doorstep we just don't know what's there, we don't know what lurks beneath, we barely mapped the ocean in any resolution at all. So there we go, that is what I'd like you guys to have a go at doing to become an oceanographer. So I've got some steps, I've got some homework. You guys have been on half term, you're not getting away scot-free, okay? So here's your homework, okay? So step one of your homework is to go whale watching, which is pretty incredible. It's incredible good fun. And you get to go in boats and chug around and see the coolest animals on earth jump out the water and land and splash you and spray you. And if you're a bit cynical and you're a bit like, don't I have to go really far away and somewhere really expensive to do that? You don't at all, because each of these yellow dots is a place that you can go whale watching in Europe. To give you an idea, we're currently there, and I would definitely recommend going and seeing some of the people over here. The Azores happens to be the best place on Earth to see whales and dolphins, and there stands just there. La Gomera is down here, another incredible place to see whales and dolphins, and there stands over there. And then up the top, we've got basking sharks and whales and orcas in Scotland. And go check out the basking shark people over there. They're not whales, but basking sharks are still pretty cool. So go check all those guys out. Um, so, your piece of homework number two is that if you really like whales and dolphins, you're like, oh my god, they're amazing, and you happen to be on holiday in somewhere where there's a park, you're like, oh, this is great, we get to see them up close, and we get to see them do tricks, then I'm going to please say, please don't go and see them in captivity, go and see them in the wild. The reason why is lots of things. First of all, they're really, really intelligent, and they live in families called pods and they live with their aunts and uncles, their brothers, their sisters, their mums and dads, their grandparents. And when people come along and they take the babies away or they take the adults away and send them to parks, it makes them really, really sad. As sad as you would feel if you were taken away from your parents. These animals are used to swimming up to 100 miles a day. 
and they get trapped in the space. Basically, it's like you being locked in a bathtub for the rest of your life. You can see that their fins have started to flop over. Because they're not swimming very much, the cartilage inside their fins degrades away. We've also started seeing how they use sound to see. So it means that every noise that they make in this tank bounces off the tank and goes, goes backwards and forwards and eventually drives them crazy. In captivity, these animals will live half as long as they would in the wild. These should live up to 80 years in the wild. They live to 40 maximum in captivity. So please, big red cross there, do not go and see them in captivity. So a lot of the organizations that I'm working with are aiming to stop new aquariums open up, but also to ensure that ones that have got whales and dolphins in captivity, that they are put into nice big tanks uh, to see out the rest of their life in, in relative comfort, that they don't have to do silly tricks and things to get their food, that they're allowed to live naturally. So finally, a little bit about plastic, and we've got a lot of stuff around here about plastic, and I'm just gonna give you one number about why it's really important to be aware of how we use plastic. So there is a lot of plastic that ends up in the ocean every year. And we've heard that every single piece of plastic that has ever been made is still with us. Every time that you have a packet of chips from a styrofoam container and chuck it in the bin, that styrofoam is gonna be around for 5,000 years. That's as long as the pyramids have already been on Earth. So being aware of how we use plastic is really important. As at the moment, this plastic is being added to our oceans and it's not breaking down. It's building up and building up. So if I said to you that eight tons of plastic was added to the ocean every year, you'd be like, whoa, a ton is big and there's eight big things. That is a lot of plastic. And I can just about imagine what eight tons looks like, but it's not eight tons. If I said that it was 80 tons of plastic. And I'm like, whoa, so 80 is like quite close to 100. 100 tons is a lot of plastic. Okay, I can't really imagine what that looks like, but it's not even 80 tons. If I said it was 8,000 tons of plastic added to our ocean every year, you'd be like, what? I don't even know what that looks like. I know that it's a big number. 8,000 is a really big number and a ton is big and there's 8,000 of these added to our ocean every year. That's a lot, but it's not even 8,000. The actual number is 8 million. 8 million tons of plastic added to our ocean every year. Not just at the, like at the moment, but every year, 8 million more, more, more tons. So this is why we need to sort out how we use plastic. Not necessarily, it's not the problem with plastic itself, but how we as humans are using it. So, um, there we go. I've harped on for ages about all kinds of things and hopefully now you guys know a little bit something else you didn't know before I started harping on at you. Which means that you are slightly more ocean literate. Yes, you guys are incredible. Can you quickly give yourselves a high five? Yeah, high five. And what is ocean literacy? Well, it is knowing how the ocean influences you and how you influence the ocean. See, the thing is, so we don't learn anything about this at school. And I'm like, why not? This is really important. Because, you know, we are an island nation. We're the ninth largest island on Earth. And, you know, you can never be more than 70 miles from the sea. So why don't we learn about it at school? This is crazy. The BBC even went there to this point, Cotton in the Elms, to show um, that it's a point in England furthest from the sea. They built a little sandcastle there, which was nice of them. I had a really good fun job and I read through the national curriculum to see where things like oceans and beaches and stuff were mentioned in it and it turns out that the reason we don't learn about it at school is it is in there but you don't have to learn about it you can learn about it if you want to and if the teacher wants to teach it to you but they too often choose things like woodlands and rainforests because they're familiar and the teacher already knows about them to teach them to you. And it's the same down here. You can learn about plants and animals, but where? Again, you can do it in the oceans, for example, or in the rainforest. So it's not actually properly in there. It's in there if you want it to be in there. And too many teachers don't know enough about the oceans, which is our problem. So I thought, well, you know what? Maybe it's in geography. And finally, geography came into its own, and it was like, yes, you need to know about globally significant places. Marine. I was like, what does this mean? Well, 
it means that everyone needs to know where the five major oceans are. I was like, oh, thanks, geography. Well done there for ocean literacy. But don't worry, because you also have to be able to use really complex words like sea, ocean, river, and beach in the correct context. Jimmy, is this a beach? Yes, miss. There you go. And that's your ocean literacy done. You're all done and dusted. So this is why we've come up with this project called Incredible Oceans, which is aiming to support the national curriculum and accidentally teach people about marine issues. So totally check out that website. We've got lots of bits and bobs on there. And we aim to support teachers in delivering content about the oceans into their schools. And there you go. There's some bits and bobs, some uh, Twitterizing things and some emails. If you want to get in touch with me, totally do that or I'll be hanging around. You can come and talk to me. Thank you ever so much for listening. You've been incredible. Thank you very much.